Hotel Orient Residency One Orientation. We are so happy to see you all this morning. We're glad you took time out of your early day to come and spend a few hours with us getting some important information that you'll need to complete your Residency One um, semester. Ms. Perkins will lead our presentation today. I will chime in on things that I think I need to chime in on and add, you know, add to anything that she says. But we are glad to see you all. We are excited about meeting you all in person on Friday. And I will now leave you in the hands of Ms. Perkins. All right. Hello, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started with our agenda. So we have a jam-packed agenda. So make sure if you haven't already gotten something to write with and something to write on that you go ahead and take a moment to do that. Uh, we have placement updates first, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about the handbook. We're going to go through the memorandum of understanding. We're gonna talk a little bit about the dispositions process as well. Uh, we were going to have a special guest, Mr. Tommy Leaders from the uh, STEA. However, he will not be able to attend this session, but you will be able to receive his slides in my follow-up email after this session. We will also go through the student concerns process practice support, and we'll hear a word from Career Services, Dr. Raquel Harris at the end. This is just a quick tip, but your notes should have each of these sections. So just take a good look at the agenda. You'll also see the report, the um, titles as well on each of the slides, and this information will be recorded if you need to refer back to it. Now, a word about placement timelines and updates. Many of you on this call have already been placed, but there are a few of the candidates in this cohort who have not yet been placed. If you uh, did whatever you needed to do in order to receive a placement before the spring, I made those requests. You received information that I made those requests, and I, your first choice placement was requested. So. Whatever uh, school district you requested first, that is what was requested when I made those. The expectation was that those were to be in by July 15th, but some districts were not able to complete those placements by that time. And they're working diligently, and I'm following up with them pretty much daily to find out how these placements are going. So if you are not placed by your first choice district by July 30th, that's when we're going to start to reach out uh, to your second and third choice placement districts. At uh, the point right before the week uh, that the semester starts, which is August 22nd, 2022, you should expect to receive your placement or you'll receive your placement status update. You'll receive an email from me letting you know uh, what placement districts I've reached out to and uh, what you can do moving forward. Um, Dr. Robinson is going to talk later about an incentive that she talked about during the preview for you to attend those first uh, two weeks of school prior to our semester starting. And you do have that option as well. While it might not be your placement school, we can work out that same incentive for you. So we'll talk more about that when we get to the infographic. You'll receive. So if you're wondering what's going on with your placement, if you have a placement, if you've missed an email, you will receive a residency placement confirmation email from me. That will be the title. So that's how you know that you received your residency placement. And as a reminder, your friends might receive their, your, their placements before you, even if they're in the same district sometimes, just due to where you might be placed. But for the most part, if you did what you needed to do to receive your placements um, by July 15th, we're working diligently on those first, second, and third choice placements. If you just recently were um, confirmed to be able to move forward, then your placement might also take some time. So please keep these timelines in mind. Also, as a reminder, this orientation, as well as the supervisor meeting greet, is worth 30 points of your seminar 
great. So orientation is 7.5 points. So you will receive an attendance certificate for attending for the duration of this event. Also, we have on Friday, the in-person supervisor meet and greet in the Ball Hall Auditorium. Your notes for both of those sections will be 15 points. So I'm gonna quickly review to make sure everyone has their first and last name showing. Very good, I see everyone has their first and last name showing. That is so we can make sure we have your information for attendance. Also, questions will be answered at the end. So if you can jot down your question on paper or if you would like to drop it in the chat, you can go ahead and do that. But I will be answering the questions at the end of each section uh, just so we can be timely. This is just a reminder of your important date. So the first week of fall 2022 placements is Monday, August 22nd, 2022. Uh, some of these dates might have been updated for districts as far as your in-service date. So if you've been placed, you want to check in with your mentor teacher to uh, determine what those in-service dates are that you can attend with that person. Uh, if you have not been placed yet, again, you're able to reach out to us if you would like to see the way uh, that the first day days of school start and if you would like to attend an in-service. And the last, last day of fall 2022 placements is November 30th, 2022. These are our core values of diversity, inclusion, respect, and innovation. And this is our office. So you heard from Dr. Robinson at the top of this hour. She's the Director of Teacher Education and Clinical Practice. Ms. Tawana Smith is your Academic Counselor. She's the Counselor for Undergraduate Advising. Ms. LaRuth Lofties is the person who would have admitted you to TEP, to the TEP program. She is the Coordinator, and she also does Graduate Advising. You will hear from Ms. Mary Lanier, who's our Licensing and Certification Specialist and the State Certification Officer. You'll hear from her at the end of the year and she will be the person to apply on your behalf for your license with the state. And I'm the clinical placement and induction coordinator. I do your placements, I, I process your background checks, and I'm here to help you in terms of practice support and other mentorship opportunities. So let's talk a little bit about the handbook. So the TECP handbook can be found on our website. And this information that's going to be shared is going to be the most recent version. So you will receive a link to this in the coming weeks. So it starts with the introduction where we go through the vision, mission, core values, and also the criteria for how your mentor teachers were selected. This next page includes contact information. So it starts with our office, the Office of Teacher Education and Clinical Practice. Then we have the program coordinators. We have the seminar instructors and administration. What I want you all to notice is that this is a hierarchy. So when you have issues or concerns, then you wanna make sure that you start at the top of this and then work your way down if needed. The next page, the next two pages include the NTAS standards and the COE focus areas. So these are the standards that govern everything that you do in your seminar, in your placement, and uh, we have the College of Education strategic priorities and focus areas. So you will see that these areas and the NTAS standards are aligned. You can take a brief look at those. Next, we have our educators dispositions assessment. It's called the EDA. You will hear me talk about this in detail later in the presentation. So dispositions, and I want you all, this group, make sure that you write this down. Dispositions are attitudes, values, and behaviors that shape how educators interact with students, colleagues, families, and anyone in their work in the P-12 environment. So this is how you show yourself, how you show up as a competent, empathetic, 
teacher. So we're going to talk about what those dispositions, what those attitudes and behaviors look like later on. But you want to make sure that you make note of what dispositions are, those attitudes, values, and behaviors that shape how educators interact in the educational environment. So the EDA is important because every student will be assessed using the EDA. However, if there are some concerns in terms of your dispositions, then an additional EDA can be completed on you by anyone who has the interaction with you, any of those key stakeholders during this uh, year. So that could be our uh, mentor teachers, supervisors, the OTECP office, anyone in the College of Education, your professor, anyone like that can do an EDA on you. So we're gonna go through the concerns process, but you can find the detailed concerns process in our handbook. We also have a section here for the code of ethics. So the code of ethics is similar to the EDA, uh, but this is for Tennessee and this is for all aspiring and current educators and it provides standards by which you judge your conduct. So you can take some time to look through those code of ethics. This next page is just an uh, infographic of what you have done. You have participated in field experience in those sophomore and junior years, and now you're in your residency placement. So this is a year long placement with the same mentor teacher. Let's talk a little bit about your role. So while you are completed this placement, you should conduct yourselves in a professional manner. So I would like a little bit of participation here. Go ahead and drop in the chat or you can unmute and tell me what does it mean to conduct yourselves in a professional manner? Be prompt. All right. Absolutely. You want to be prompt. You want to be on time. What else? I would say like watching your, oh. Oh, go ahead, Sarah. I would say like watching like your tone of voice, um, the words that you say and like mm -hmm. your dress code. Absolutely, you've hit on several of the disposition indicators. Thank you for that. Did someone else unmute? I hear someone else's yeah, voice. Um, I said dress appropriately. Absolutely, appropriate dress. Madison said to be mindful and self-aware when interacting with those around you. Be on time and present. All right. It sounds like you took that straight from the EDA. That's perfect. Be respectful, look professional, follow the rules of the school. Absolutely, conduct yourself in a professional manner. Be accountable. Yes, all right. So you all have a great idea of what we mean when we talk about those professional dispositions and conducting yourselves in a professional manner. So when you enter your placement, you've signed an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding. You are agreeing to follow the rules of your placement school and our university. You are a representative of the university and you're a representative of yourself. This opportunity that you have this is a year long placement, but it's also a year long interview for you. A lot of our candidates go on to work for the schools or the school districts where they were placed. So you wanna use this opportunity to present yourself as your very best and demonstrate what you're able to do as a teacher so that you can be hired and so that you can start to build your reputation as a great teacher. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the EDA. So we want to make sure that you remember that if you show some of those behaviors that are unprofessional and that are unbefitting of a teacher, then the EDA would be done on you. And the removal of a candidate will be done for a compelling reason. So just keep in mind that we do have a process by which you will be able to uh, hear about the concerns and have an opportunity to change. So Director of Teacher Education and Clinical Practice and the Assistant Dean and teacher faculty and administrators would consider the removal of a candidate collaboratively. So this is a, a process that we will be talking about. 
And I will talk more about the MOU as well in detail, uh, but that's that memorandum of understanding that you signed with all of this information that we're going through on it. So you're gonna make sure that you understand what we're expecting of you. This next section is just about placement. Uh, so grade level preference, location, and special circumstances are considered. However, there's not a guarantee. And we make every effort to uh, include and consider what you all are asking for in your uh, placement request. However, sometimes we cannot meet all of those uh, requests. You can also not reach out on your own behalf for a uh, placement. Now, this is a section that you definitely want to have in your notes. Write it down, highlight it, underline it. Attendance. This is where we get most of our questions during the year. During the fall and spring semester placements, candidates are required to follow their school's placement schedule for all holidays and breaks. All right. So when your placement school goes on fall break, are you on fall break? Yes. Yes. Good. When the University of Memphis is on fall break, are you on fall break? No. No, thank you, Dominique. I want you all to make sure that you understand that. Now, although you all get off the holidays and the breaks of your placement school, that does not mean that you do not have to go to your classes. So keep that in mind as you are uh, planning ahead for those holidays and breaks as you get your placement school schedule. Candidates are also required to follow the mentor teacher schedule and attend all in-service days with their mentor teacher. So that's during the semester. All right, so August 22nd to November 30th, there will be some days that the students are out and the teachers are in. You are expected to attend on those days. Also, teachers arrive before and leave after students. So that is a habit that you want to start now. You are expected to arrive uh, typically about 30 minutes early and leave 30 minutes after the students leave. This is something that you want to discuss with your mentor teacher. Discuss their schedule because you are going to be modeling their schedule. During residency one, you're also allowed two absences and you will make up all days over those two and all unexcused absences. So you're allowed two excused absences. Let's talk a little bit about what excused absences are. What would be some reasons for excused absences? What are some examples? Like a doctor's appointment. So if a doctor's appointment can be scheduled at another time, then that is not an example of an excused absence. Um, if it's a situation of an emergency, which you would uh, talk to with your mentor, teacher, and supervisor, then, and you have that doctor's note, then that is an example of excused. But typically, if the doctor's appointment is going to be considered unexcused because you can do it at another time family emergency so that's uh, another one absolutely emergencies do come up but that's something you would want to communicate with your um, mentor teacher and supervisor to make sure your definition of an emergency is actually an emergency um, so some examples that so that you all can make sure that you understand this illness illness due to COVID or other illnesses um, True emergencies, death in the family, those are the types of things that are considered emergencies. So those are not limiting. That list is not exhaustive. However, that is what we're talking about in terms of emergencies, things that just cannot be avoided, extenuating circumstances. Now let's talk about unexcused absences. What are some examples of unexcused absences?
um you woke up late you woke up late woke up late i didn't feel like going today those types of things uh weddings also uh family events vacation those are examples of unexcused absences and all unexcused absences must be made up so let me give you an example and i would like full participation here so i would like to hear from Ms. Jones, Brenda, Dominique, you've been participating. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, Kamaya, Madison, Sarah, Halia, I would like Destiny. I'd like to hear from all of you all, either in the chat or in um, if you want to unmute. All right. So, uh, and thank you, Destiny, for dropping that in the chat. Uh, car issues. So, Again, that's one of those situations. If it's an emergency where you know you um, are in a car accident, that of course would be an example of an emergency and that would be excused. But this list is not exhaustive because many different things can come up. Now, if it's a persistent situation that keeps you from being able to attend your placement, then that's not going to be considered an excused absence or tardy so that is something that you want to consider and communicate with your mentor teacher and supervisor so that you all are on the same page in terms of those excused and unexcused absences all right so this is the example let's say that a person is sick with covid and it leads them to be out for five days is that excused or unexcused? And how many days would they have to make up? All right, excused, thank you. Excused and they would have to make up three. Very good. So you wanna make sure that you are uh, calculating that correctly and that you're logging that you'll be logging this in student learning and licensure and I will go through student learning and licensure with you and show you how to sign in how to log your time how to complete your portfolio and uh, anything else related to SLL we'll be doing that on Friday at our in-person meeting all right so yes Kamaya I'm a little confused on how if you have COVID which is out of your control, you would have to make up the days because that's the recommended days off per the CDC, not because you want to be off. Right. So you must uh, complete those 15 weeks of your placement for your license. So you still have to make up those days. So it's not a, a rule that we're making that you have to do those 15 weeks. That is a rule of the Tennessee Department of Education. So it's not a punishment. This is something that you have to do those numbers of days. So you would have to make those up. In the same way, and I'm glad that you asked that question, Kamaya, you have to make up snow days. Snow days or other unexpected school closing days must be made up unless we make an exception. And that is because you have to complete those 15 weeks each semester. So and I just wanted to add to that, Ms. Perkins, Kamaya, one way that you can cover, let's say if you get COVID and you are absent more than the two excused absences that you receive, if you all take advantage of going and visiting your placements during the first two weeks of school, we will count those days towards absences that you attended early. So if you can do any of those days, you would already have, let's say you go out and you do a full week, five days during those first two weeks of school before you're required to attend your placement, then a week would count. Um, you would have five days banked if you needed them to add to your two excused absences, or you could use that time to um, count towards that Friday half days that you all must attend. So if you did a week, 10 of your half day Fridays would be covered and you wouldn't have to go to the placement on that Friday. 
So we, we are trying to build in incentives to help you all this semester, but we also have to meet the state requirements for the number of contact hours that you all have in the field. And of course, always, we have wonderful supervisors. They will always work with you. Sometimes you can make that up just by maybe going to school an hour early, staying an hour late. They will work with you on how those days can be made up. If it's a special event at the school in the evening or on the weekend, you can count that time towards it. So when you meet with your supervisor on Friday, you know, they'll talk to you about those types of things, but they are wonderful people and they do understand that things happen. And we all in this in the office will try to work with you all. I think the the most important thing for us is it's a part of the dispositions. It's just emphasizing that the expectation is that you all will show up and be present and involved in your classrooms. All right, thank you for that, for that Dr. Robinson. So if you have any symptoms of coronavirus or you had contact with a confirmed or suspected case of coronavirus, please call the health center at those numbers. And there are also some public information numbers right here. And then if you've had the quarantine due to COVID and you need to make arrangements with your prof professors, please call the Dean of Students uh, or email them at this uh, email address because they'll be able to help you uh, with those arrangements. And then again, as a reminder, snow days and other unexpected school days must be made up, all right? You're gonna be documenting all of your time and your absences in SLL, and I will show you all that on Friday. For professional dress, you are required to dress in professional attire. So you want to think business casual attire and you want to adhere to the uh, teacher dress code at your assigned school, you must adhere to that. So what you wanna think about when you go to your placement school is you wanna find the best dressed teacher in the building. And you wanna model yourself after that so that you can put your best foot forward as well. You'll be able to see the culture and the climate of your school and what the expectations are um, when you get to your placement, but also make sure that you talk to your mentor teacher about the dress code before you get there. It's also acceptable to wear school spirit shirts on appropriate days. So there might be special days uh, that you all have with the children, like May or um, some school spirit days. They might have jamboree. Those types of days where the administration has given approval, you are uh, permitted to wear school spirit shirts. Outside commitments. So work or family commitments cannot be excuses for failing to meet the commitments of the placement and the professional seminar. So this is a year-long placement experience and the expectation is that you're going to follow through with that commitment. So if there are persistent patterns where our work or family and personal commitments are getting in the way, then you'll be given the choice of withdrawing from your placement or making the adjustments needed so you can give the attention that is required for you to successfully complete the program. Um, it's also highly recommended that uh, you do not work during the placement if possible. So uh, please keep that in mind as well. We cannot tell you not to work. Many students have to support themselves. However, it cannot interfere with your workday hours. So we have substitute teaching and being a teacher assistant. Candidates might, may not serve as substitute teachers. You cannot be a substitute teacher in the classroom. You cannot be the only person there when your mentor teacher is absent they must get a substitute in that classroom for you, okay? Teachers, candidates can teach, so you can use that opportunity to build your skills and to teach the candidates as long as there is a substitute teacher in that room. That is a liability for you to be there alone. So if you're currently employed as a teacher assistant, please reach out to Dr. Robinson if you haven't already to discuss any placement concerns. I, I know that 
a couple of you all on this call, I already have reached out. Uh, we do not engage in or administer uh, corporal punishment. Now let's talk a little bit about school day commitments. You are assigned to get a hands-on experience. So last year, previous years, you all have done observational experiences. Residency is not just an observational experience. You will be expected to co-teach, teach on your own. You're going to be assisting. You're going to be rotating in the classroom, working in groups. You are going to be another teacher in that classroom. So keep in mind that you have to be an owner of this experience. You have to take initiative. So during that school day, you have to have that mindset that you are not just going to observe. Please also note that you're not allowed to work on lesson plans, ed, TPA, or other things while you are in the placement, unless it's before school, after school, or during the planning period. The technology policy pretty much follows that. You need to follow the cell phone policy for the teachers in your school. So ask about that at your placement school. And you should never have them while class is in session unless you're using them or other technology um, for the instruction. So you should not have your laptop, a tablet, your cell phone, any technology like that unless it's approved by your mentor teacher and it's being used for instructional purposes. And of course, you are not allowed to bring your devices for uh, to work on coursework, pay bills, shop online, those types of things. You should keep that technology out of this placement experience. You can assist with planning and chaperoning field trips uh, in conjunction with your mentor teacher, but you cannot use your vehicle to transport students. All students, all teacher candidates need uh, professional liability insurance. This cohort has done a wonderful job of getting your professional liability insurance in and uploaded to Baltrix. Um, if you have not, you will be receiving an email from me because you cannot attend your placement until you have the professional liability insurance, which is up to a $1 million, of the minimum of a $1 million coverage. So if you join STA or a similar organization that has that million dollar coverage and you've uploaded it, then you're good to go. We also encourage you to uh, maintain a current health insurance policy. For lesson plans, you will follow the lesson plan for format provided by the University of Memphis. So you will be exposed to many different lesson plan types. So you might have a school-based lesson plan. There might be a district pacing guide or lesson plan, but you have to follow the university format and you're gonna be following the detailed lesson plan format for this first semester. When you complete your lesson plans, they have to be turned in to your mentor teacher two teaching days prior to teaching the lesson before the start of the school day. That will give your mentor teacher time to give you feedback. Some mentor teachers will not even allow you to teach in their classroom if they don't receive that lesson because they don't know what your plan is. So this is really to help you to do your very best to, to get that coaching and feedback before you get in front of students. So two teaching days prior. So if, it's, if you're gonna be teaching on Wednesday, then you need to be turning in that lesson plan Monday morning. So if you're absent, you just like a, um, a teacher of record will have to provide a copy of the lesson plan and related materials for your mentor teacher. It's also the responsibility of teacher candidates to upload your lesson plans to student learning and licensure, and you should provide hard copies of the plans to your mentor teachers if they request those. Next sections go over the roles. So the role of the principal was to approve the placement and to select the mentor teachers, and they also step in if needed uh, for school-based issues. Your mentor teacher is going to be 
be a primary person and your first point of contact when it comes to the placement experience. We're going to talk more about the co-teaching model, but you will be following the co-teaching model with your mentor teacher. You will work with them to plan, deliver, and assess instruction. Your mentor teacher will also consult with the clinical supervisor about your process. So your progress. So if you need additional support or help, then they will talk to them about how you're doing. They'll talk to, uh, to them about your strengths and uh, if there are any concerns. Your mentor teacher will assist you as well. So you will be assessed formally by your mentor teacher and you'll have a summative assessment at the end. And the mentor teacher also completes the educator disposition on you. The role of the clinical supervisors is to provide an extra level of support. So they will collaborate and plan with the mentor teachers to ensure that that co-teaching model is being followed. And they will provide you with additional input and support as it relates to uh, your planning and instruction. They will also complete the formative and summative assessments and they'll check your portfolios as well. If there are any issues that we need to be aware of, your clinical supervisor is the person who you can talk to because they serve as a liaison between us as the University of Memphis and that placement school. And then we have our office. So our office uh, serves to be a, another level of support for you. We I process your background checks, we make the placements, and we make sure that we adhere to the policies and standards of the state so that you can be licensed at the end of this experience. We also can collect any necessary forms and documents related to your placement, and we have events and orientations like this one in our end of year celebration. We are uh, in regular communication with the district, with school leaders, with mentor teachers, with you and with your supervisors. So we serve as a point of for all of those parties. We will be having a co-teaching workshop in September. You all will be receiving that date. It will be on a Saturday, but you'll be receiving that date in the coming weeks. So please be sure that you uh, check your emails regularly to receive that date. We're going to talk in detail about the co-teaching model. However, if you want to have just a brief overview of the co-teaching model, then you can check it out in our handbook. We also have a few pages that go over terms and definitions because during the semester we'll be using many uh, words and phrases that you might not have heard before. So if you have questions about those, then you can check the handbook. So before I move forward, I'm going to go ahead and check the chat. All right, it looks like we don't have any questions in the chat. Does anyone want to uh, share any questions before I move forward? Yes, I had a question. So you had said um, about the in-service, so we contact you about the in-service days, like what times, or do I no. contact the mentor teacher? You contact your mentor teacher because it's gonna vary by your placement. Okay, perfect. I think she's talking about Ms. Perkins when you said if it's somebody that doesn't have a placement. If you yes. don't have a placement yet, and you're interested in attending some of the in-service days or the first day of school, if you reach out to Ms. Perkins and I, we will reach out to one of our partner schools to see if you can at least go in for one in-service day to participate in the first day of school. So if you don't have a placement and you're really interested in trying to get out during those first two weeks, please email us because we will try to contact and see if we can arrange for you to at least get that done until you receive your placement. Sarah, do you have a placement? Yes. Okay, all right. Yes, so please con contact your mentor teacher about the in-services during the year and uh, which one you want to go to before the semester starts. Okay, thank you. All right. 
All right. So let's go ahead and do the residency guide. This is actually a part of the handbook as well. So the residency guide is going to be at the very end. And you want to make sure because all of them look just about alike that you look at the one that says human development and learning slash early childhood education. So, and I wanna be sure, because I saw several students join. Uh, this is the session for human development and learning. So if you are not human development and learning, a recording will be sent to you. You can still stay on the call, but what I'm gonna be sharing is specific to human development and learning. So we have residency one, during residency one, you're gonna attend one day with mentors during the in-service week to offer assistance. During the first seven weeks, you're going to attend your sites three days per week. That Friday is gonna be a half day where you go to your placement uh, in the morning and then you head to your uh, seminar from one to four in the afternoon. Then you have September where you're gonna attend the co-teaching workshop. And then the last eight weeks, you're going to plan implement and assess at least two lessons per week and co-teach with your mentor teacher daily. These are the practice exams that you need to pass. You all have three practice exams you need to, to pass uh, with the one that you need to pass by December 25th being 5025 early childhood education. 5025 early childhood education. And that's by this December 1st, you all. Not December 25th. I think you were getting it. Oh, thinking yeah. about Christmas. <laughs> okay. Yes. By the, thank you, Dr. Robinson. By December 1st. By December 1st. So early childhood education, 5025. You have to pass that by December 1st. Then by February 15th, you'll need to pass your other two exams, 5205 and 5024. For residency one, the in-service week dates vary, so reach out to your mentor teacher about those dates. Then we have the uh, first week dates vary as well, but most of the dates are around that first week in August. Weeks two through seven, you're going to, one through seven, you're going to uh, visit your sites Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday morning. And then weeks uh, eight through 15, Monday through Friday, you're going to be attending. So all five days after that seventh week, you will be in your placement and you're going to do that half day on Friday unless you take advantage of the incentive that Dr. Robinson talked about. These are the courses that you will be taking. Uh, so you have those two courses, Monday and Wednesday, and then ECED 45, 40, Tuesday, Thursday. And then you have your seminars on Friday, one, two, four. You will have the responsibility of writing those lesson plans throughout the semester. You will also uh, need to turn those in two teaching days prior to teaching the lesson. During the first seven weeks, you will be evaluated once you'll have that one co-evaluation, which serves as a practice for you to understand how you are being evaluated by your mentor and your uh, supervisor. During the final eight weeks, you will have two formal evaluations, one from your supervisor, one from your mentor teacher, and you're going to be expected to do uh, to teach two different lesson plans per week. So your semester long expectations are to co-teach and teach with your mentor teacher and to use the detailed lesson plan format from the University of Memphis. When you are formally evaluated, each evaluation will start with a pre-conference where you explain to your mentor, teacher, or supervisor what your plan is and you provide that lesson plan. Then you're going to teach and after you teach, you will have a post-conference with your mentor or supervisor where they share with you what your strengths are and what you need to work on. You're going to take in what they said, take in your experience, and also so go into SLL and review their evaluation on you so that you can have a full understanding of what happened. Then you're going to complete a lesson reflection. The lesson reflection is due by that next teaching day at the beginning of the next school day. So you want to make sure after you teach that you go ahead and make note 
of the things that you need to make note of for that reflection. We do provide lesson reflection prompts, so you will be scored based on how you respond to those questions for each evaluation. During residency one, you also have the opportunity to uh, review four different classes. So you'll be using a form called uh, observation of teaching. Uh, you'll work with your mentor teacher to determine which four teachers uh, you're going to observe and when they will be able to open their classroom to you for you to observe. Similar to the reflection, the observation of teaching uh, has question and prompts and you're gonna answer those and those uh, will be uploaded to the portfolio. It'll be a tab in the portfolio. I've talked a little bit or referred to the student learning and licensure system, but that is the system that you will use to turn in most of your forms, most of your uh, products. This is the, the information that you will use for the residency portfolio. And this is also how you're going to be evaluated. This is where we house our evaluations. You will also submit your time logs in SLL. So you'll get a preview of all of that on Friday. This is uh, where we talk about your residency one assignments. This is also on the exit grading form, but you are going to be um, evaluated by your mentor teacher and they're going to complete the professional disposition assessment on you, which is worth 18 points. Your time logs, which you will complete are worth 25 points. And then your formal evaluations will be scored by your mentor teacher, you'll have one by the mentor, one by the supervisor. It's scored in SLL and that score in the system, both of those scores will be uh, averaged for your, um, for your points. And the total that you can get is 100 points. The way that the formal formative evaluation will be scored is similar uh, to the summative. So the two will be averaged from your mentor and your supervisor. Then we have the portfolio. You'll submit several different things to the portfolio in SLL, and that's worth 100 points. You have the co-teaching workshop attendance in September that is mandatory, that's 25 points. And then this orientation, as well as the meet and greet and the notes are worth 30 points. So these are the tabs of the portfolio. So tab one is where you will submit all of your evaluated lessons. So co-evaluated, the mentor teacher evaluated documents and the supervisor evaluation documents. Tab two is for reflections for all of your evaluated lessons. Tab three are those uh, four observational teaching forms. Tab four is evidence of school-based activities. So you wanna think about that as things you do outside of the classroom. So it might be faculty meetings or IEP meetings or special activities and sessions that are not those uh, classroom instructional activities. Then you will also provide uh, two additional lesson plans that were not evaluated. So that's the total uh, for your portfolio for 100 points. So that's the end of the infographic and the end of this section. What we're going to do now is a brief check for understanding. So I would like uh, full participation here. How many excused absences must be made up? All right, so I see none. So the number of excused absences that must be made up are any after two. So excused absences still have to be made up if you miss more than two days. Anything after two, very good, thank you. All right, so be sure if you wrote in your notes about the attendance that anything after two must be made up. How many unexcused absences must be made up? Oh, very good. Thank you, Madison and Halia, all of them. What are some examples of excused absences? And you all can unmute or drop in the chat. 
family, so family emergencies. Mm -hmm. All right, illness, especially uh, illness due to COVID, illness for other reasons, death in the family. Those are some reasons. Those are some excused absences. So if you don't have those examples, be sure to write those down because everything is not an excused absence. Then we have examples of unexcused absences. What are some examples of unexcused absences that we talked about? Vacation, absolutely. Woke up late, mm -hmm. too tired to go, absolutely. Those are examples of unexcused absences. When can you use technology in your placement school? When is it appropriate to use technology? All right, planning period, when approved and using it for instruction. Mm -hmm. And I love this response. It depends on the rules of your What? So you wanna check on what your placement school's rules are, all right? How many days do you attend your placement during your first seven weeks? Three. All right, very good. So you attend uh, your placement on those three days with the third two and a half. Friday being a, with the I was just days. saying two and a half, not three, because Friday is a half day. Yes, with Friday being a half day. So yeah, two and a half. All right, when should lesson plans be turned in? Two days before. Yes, two teaching that two days before teaching your lesson. And what are professional dispositions? Your yes, your attitude and your behavior, how you govern yourself. Very good. All right. So you all have earned a 10-minute break. I know that was a lot of information. So we will be coming back at that end of 10 minutes to finish out this session.
we have about 15 seconds. All right, welcome back. That was a fast 10 minutes. All right, so we're gonna go over the Memorandum of Understanding and the Educator Disposition Assessment next. So I refer to the Memorandum of Understanding in the handbook, but this is what you sign, what you are required to sign and to turn into Qualtrics. And again, if you have not done this, please make sure that you get this done. This is a good reminder because I will be sending emails to anyone who's missing documentation at the beginning of next week. And you have to get this signed to attend your placement. So as a reminder, you have to conduct yourselves in a professional manner. And what I want to highlight here is about actions and words during your clinical teaching semester. Not only is this a year long placement and interview, but the individuals who you interact with uh, can serve as recommendations and they can give a good word for you uh, when you start this, uh, the early parts of your career if you do a great job. So think about that with your mentor teacher, your clinical supervisor, school administrators, and even our office. So you wanna make sure that you're conducting yourselves in a professional manner at all times. But clinical candidates who are demonstrating performance behaviors or dispositions that are unbefitting of a U of M teacher candidate will be subject to removal from their placement. And if in some cases, they might be subject to removal from the TEP program. This is just another reminder that clinical placements are conducted uh, and chosen uh, through our office. We work with the districts to make those placements and you are not allowed to request or locate those placements. Also grade level and location preferences are considered, but they are not guaranteed. For attendance, you are allowed two excused absences and you have to make up all days over those two as well as all unexcused absences. Also, you wanna make sure you make every effort to be at your placement school. It is so important that you get this full experience. So if absences can be avoided, then they should. Now, this is something if you don't already have any in your notes about seminars. So the clinical teaching uh, semester includes, both semesters include a seminar course and that seminar course is required. The seminar is designed to prepare you for your EdTPA experience. So please be sure that you understand you attend that class and failure to attend that class will affect your ability to move forward in the program. If you have to miss, uh, then you must make up the days that you miss and we talked about those attendance days and you're going to make those up in accordance uh, with the approval of your mentor teacher. But excessive absences might lead to your placement being canceled or rescheduled for another time when you're able to consistently uh, be at the school. So tardies and leaving school early. So that is not permitted. You wanna make sure that you are at your placement site 30 minutes before and at dismissal 30 minutes after so that you can get the full experience of what your mentor teacher does. Your mentor teacher might have cafeteria duty in the morning or car rider duty in the afternoon or other duties in the school that you want to be a part of. So you have the University of Memphis lesson plan format and you must submit those lesson plans two teaching days prior and failure to turn in those lesson plans consistency, consistently might uh, be your reason for you to have an EDA, uh, Educator Dispositions Assessment, done on you. Social media, I want you all to make sure you write this down in your notes. We want you to refrain from posting 
anything about the clinical teaching semester. So pictures of mentors, pictures of students, events at your placement school. I wanna make sure that you're very careful if you choose to use social media during this year. Um, you are cautioned to remove any inappropriate pictures, any uh, commentary about your personal life that you would not want parents, students, your principal, your mentor teacher, anyone in that environment, us to see, okay? This is important. When I was a teacher, um, I remember a student uh, coming to me, and I don't use social media a lot, uh, but they came and they saw uh, a picture of me from college and they just wanted to let me know they liked my hair that way. They thought that I should wear it that way. So what they told me, I wanted to know how they found it. And they told me, oh, we, we like to look up our teachers' uh, social media pages. So they did this to oh, pretty much all of the teachers. It's just a pastime. So that is something that can happen to you. It's one thing for your students to see it. Even when you all are working with young students, you will be surprised at what they're able to do with social media. And also the parents might look you up. They might wanna know what you're about and they're gonna to go to the social media for, uh, for that. So outside commitments. You wanna make sure that work, family, personal commitments do not interfere excessively with your clinical teaching semester. And you're also required to dress in professional attire. You have to adhere to the dress code of your school. These, this next section outlines the professional requirements of the semester. So this is another reminder for you to be an active participant and engaged owner of your experience. You want to make sure that you demonstrate professional behavior, that you turn in your assignments on time, that you collaborate with your mentor teacher, and if you need help, that you, to initiate those conversations uh, to ensure that you get the help that you need. And then in terms of handling confidential information, you are going to have to handle confidential information in a professional manner and you should not share about your school, students or mentor teachers privately or publicly. So uh, adhere to the deadlines, make sure you turn in things for our office, for your seminar instructor, to your mentor teacher on time. And uh, be sure to cite uh, sources if you use any sources out uh, your semester of teaching. And uh, that is the MOU. That's the information that I want to cover from the MOU. So be sure that if you haven't already signed it to sign it. But the reason why we wanted to take some time to go over that is I know that sometimes we might sign documents and might not have given it a good look. We might not have read it and understood what we're signing. So this is the expectation that we've laid out, not only in the handbook, but also the memorandum of understanding. So before I move on, are there any questions about the MOU? All right. So let's talk about the educator disposition assessment and the EDA concerns process. So the educator disposition assessment is an instrument that was created by the University of Tampa. And this is a reliable instrument. It's been used and it helps uh, for us to know what uh, standards you should use to judge your performance and your dispositions in the classroom and outside of the classroom. So during this experience, throughout this experience as a teacher, there are nine indicators that we're going to be going over. And you can find this page, I'm gonna drop this page so that you all can uh, follow along. We are going to be doing uh, activity where we look at a few scenarios. So please be sure to pay attention to these nine indicators. So the first, first I wanna go over how you're going to be scored. You can either get two meets expectations, one developing or zero needs improvement. During this first semester, you wanna be in the one or two area. So that's really where we're going to focus. We're going to focus our attention on that. We know that you 
come in needing to work on different things, needing to develop. So you can't expect to have all too straight down for meet expectations this semester. But you do not want to be in the area of needs improvement where there's minimal evidence of understanding of your commitment to that disposition. So the first disposition is demonstrates effective oral and communication skills. So this indicator is uh, referring to your ability to communicate, to communicate for your audience. So using the appropriate language, grammar and word choice for your environment. So when you think about teaching your uh, students from K to two, kindergarten to second grade, you would not explain something to a kindergartner the same way you would explain it to a second grader. So you wanna be sure to know how to vary your communication and that your communication is involved in such a way that students want to participate in uh, your lesson. The second indicator is demonstrates effective written communication skills. So this one is referring to how you communicate in the written word. So you communicate respectfully and positively with all stakeholders. So that might be notes home to parents, that might be emails to your uh, principal other teachers or even our office staff. And in those, you also wanna be sure to demonstrate precise spelling and grammar. The third disposition, this is one that we have to highlight a lot, this demonstrates professionalism. So that looks like responding promptly to communication, submitting all of your assignments, uh, exhibiting punctuality and attendance. So earlier when we talked about professionalism, you all hit on many of these points. Now these next two are very important as well. You must maintain professional boundaries. All right, you are a professional in the classroom and you must behave as such. So you must uh, follow ethical standards of practice and keep inappropriate things out of that classroom. You also want to be a productive uh, part of the collaborative group. Typically, you will be, uh, when you become a teacher on a teaching team, you uh, might not be the only person in the classroom. So that is a situation where you wanna make sure that you are a contributor. The fourth disposition is demonstrates a positive and enthusiastic attitude. So you want to actively seek solutions to problems without prompting or complaining. You wanna be an owner and not a critic in your classroom environment. You also want to meet expectations by trying different ideas out. Try things that are uh, suggested by your mentor, teacher, or your supervisor. And also demonstrate a positive ethic with students. You should be a positive force in that classroom. Disposition five is demonstrates preparedness in teaching and learning. So this means that you're able to accept and take feedback and use that feedback. You're gonna implement that feedback. You also want to be able to learn and adjust from your own experience. So as you're reflecting on your lessons, you should be able to take what you learn from your experiences and make changes that help you to be a better teacher. You should also come to class prepared with all of your materials, everything that you need. So think about those lesson plans. Think about the things that you might need to print out and do prior to you teaching that lesson. Also, you have to be flexible. Teachers must be flexible. You have to alter your lessons that are in progress. I cannot tell you all how many times I was in the class and I had a lesson and I thought that it was gonna go one way. And then I realized, oh, I need to go back and teach this. They're not getting this part. So I had to alter those lessons. You will learn how to do that, but the expectation is you show a commitment to you being able to alter your lessons in progress. This position six is exhibits an appreciation of and a value for cultural and academic diversity. So this looks like you planning lessons and creating an environment that is safe for your students 
to be able to uh, to show up in that classroom and feel comfortable in that classroom. So you want to be able to create an environment of total inclusiveness. So that looks like what you do in your planning, but that also looks like what you do in terms of negative behaviors that relate to diversity. You want to make sure that you correct um, those behaviors in the classroom and let the students know that all students are safe in that space. Disposition seven collaborates effectively with stakeholders. So I want you all to think about stakeholders as the individuals in your learning environment and outside of that learning environment. So in your learning environment, that's gonna be your professors, that's gonna be our office staff, that's gonna be your supervisors. And then in your teaching environment, that's going to look like your mentor teacher, your students, your, your the parents, your other teachers who you work with in that school building, the administration, uh, the community. Those are individuals that you will need to uh, know how to respectfully interact with. So you need to be able to demonstrate flexibility and to maintain a respectful tone. And especially when it comes to uh, your teaching environment, you want to be the person to proactively share teaching strategies and ideas. So Dr. Robinson shared with another group that each year, Mentor teachers always say that they learned something from their students and they love how much they learned in new teaching practices from their students. So this is an opportunity during this year for you to not only try out new deals, but to share those ideas when you see how they will uh, benefit the instructional environment. This position eight is demonstrate self-regulated learner behaviors takes initiative. So you want to make sure you have that word down in your notes. You want to take initiative. This is when you meet expectations, you want to recognize your own weaknesses and be able to work on those weaknesses proactively. So let's say it's classroom management. The first few weeks you might notice, I need to brush up on some different strategies for classroom management before you even ask for help. This is the opportunity where you go out and you research and you work to implement the strategies that you think will work for your teaching style. This is also an opportunity uh, seven and eight. These are opportunities where you can take initiative in the classroom. So it might be that your mentor teacher has uh, some papers that they haven't graded or an anchor chart they've been meaning to uh, create you can be the person to be a problem solver in the classroom by doing that. Now you wanna do that in accordance with your mentor teacher. You don't wanna take over the classroom, but you do wanna make sure that you're a positive force in that classroom. Indicator nine is the last indicator, exhibits the social and emotional intelligence to promote personal and educational goals and stability. So this is where we're talking about your maturity as a professional. So you're going to demonstrate maturity and be able to discuss really sensitive topics without getting upset and being able to remain calm. This is also about you being able to show perseverance, be able to show grit during this year. This year will probably be a challenge at some point. But your ability to say that you're going to follow through and do what you need to do, regardless of the circumstances, is what that looks like. Demonstrating sensitivity to feelings of others, um, evidenced by compassionate and empathetic social awareness. So what that looks like is you being able to be understanding. Uh, Dr. Robinson gave a great example of if your teacher, your uh, mentor teacher has been sick or has been out or struggling with something and you might need to take up over more of a lesson than usual, you can be that person to be understanding and compassionate about that situation. And that compassion will also extend to your students and the others in your building, our office staff, all of those key stakeholders that we talked about. You wanna be able to demonstrate that in order to meet expectations on the EVA. So 
I've talked quite a bit about the educator disposition assessment. We are going to do this little activity now. So I want you all to click that link if you all don't already have the EDA standards up. And what I'm going to be asking you to do is to listen to the scenario and then tell me what's wrong with this, this situation, what this person's struggling with. And then you're going to tell me which indicator would they receive that zero on. So scenario one, Serena's social media. Serena loves social media. She has thousands of followers and regularly posts on every platform. Sometimes she may use inappropriate language, but her page is private or so she thinks. When she starts student teaching, she loves her students so much that she just wants to share videos and pictures of them. She uses her phone to record students. So what's wrong with this situation? You cannot record students um, and post them on social media without, um, I can't think of the word right now, my mind is blanking, um, without permission from their parents or guardians. Absolutely, that is a huge no-no. They actually have to um, sign forms. Each individual student has to sign forms as a release because you usually cannot share anything like that. And she clearly does not have permission. Thank you for that, Kamaya. Anyone else? She, okay. okay, go ahead. Inappropriate, inappropriate language. Um, mm -hmm. And then the fact that she has uh, thousands of followers, she never knows who's following her. Exactly. Very good. So it could be one of those parents. It could be a principal. So, and she thinks that her page is private, but they might be able to still get to her page. All right. And then I see in the chat, she, the way she uh, presents herself through social media can be seen by parents and it looks unprofessional. Very good, Brenda. So let's talk about the dispositions that she is showing. Well, the disposition that she's not showing, where she needs improvement, which ones? I would say on professionalism, because she shouldn't be taking her phone out in the classroom and taking pictures of her students, because that's probably not a rule that's okay at her school. Mm -hmm. And so Clearly, she probably doesn't know about the rules. So I'd say she needs to work on her professionalism. Absolutely. She's crossing major boundaries of ethical practice. Wonderful. Any other ones? All right, let's think about the written communication. So she's using inappropriate language. So that's another one that is uh, this totally inappropriate. All right. So let's go ahead and go to Terry's timeliness. Terry is a vibrant, aspiring teacher. However, he's always struggled with timeliness. His supervisor emails him on Friday about an assignment that was due on Thursday but he does not check his email until Monday. Although his supervisor reminds him that le lesson plans are due two teaching days before the lesson is taught, he frequently sends his lesson plans the evening prior to teaching. What's wrong with Terry's behavior? Time management. Yes, absolutely. Time management is a big issue, right? Um, he's also not taking initiative of, of like his weaknesses and realizing that he's not like a very, he's like a procrastinator maybe. Um, yes. And so he's, he, he should probably take a point to like look at his email more often. Very um, good. So he's not very self-aware and not taking initiative on improving this, right? Good. There's one more that I am looking for. So let's talk about some of these indicators. 
which one of the indicators does uh, Terry seem to be struggling with? Comes to class unplanned without needed materials. Um, disposition five. Absolutely. Disposition five is the main one, preparedness to teach. So the, Terry is not doing what Terry needs to do in order to be prepared for class. So preparedness to teach would be low. There are some other ones. How about demonstrates professionalism? Yes, very good, Halia, demonstrating professionalism. So Terry is not responding to communications and does not submit all of his assignments. So that's, that's a major issue. And that's the, one of the um, points on the indicator. Is there another one? also say eight as well, recognizing our weaknesses and working on those uh, based on what one of our candidates just talked about. Okay. All right, let's look at the third one. Unruly Rudy. Rudy has always been a high achiever, but she's been known to have an attitude. When Rudy emails staff, she sends brief emails without greetings or signatures. She emails the staff with questions at least once a week. If she does not hear back from one staff member, she'll, she'll email another one. During virtual meetings, she's been known to interrupt the speaker to get her point across. What is going on with Rudy? She doesn't have effective communication skills, like orally Absolutely. or through email. Very good. Very good. So that's disposition one and disposition two, oral and written communication. Anything else? All right, so I would also say that uh, disposition nine, she is uh, indicating a level of immaturity and not being able to uh, control herself. Also demonstrates professionalism. So Rudy is not uh, being a good collaborative group member. Rudy is not communicating well. So one, two, uh, I would say three, and especially I would also say that emotional intelligence is lacking there. So we're able to look at these educator disposition assessments and we know what we need to do and we know those none examples. You all, I want to share that each of these scenarios, of course, the names have been changed. Each of these are real situations and they were a reason why we've had to uh, have EDA meetings with students. So please keep these in mind that these are real and you want to avoid uh, these situations. So now let's talk about the disposition concerns process which can be found on our website and in the handbook. So you all have been introduced to the process and all mentor teachers will complete EDAs uh, on you all each semester. The uh, course instructors, clinical supervisors, and or mentor teachers um, can do EDAs if they see disposition concerns. One EDA is a warning. You wanna take that warning seriously. This is a situation where the candidate and the person who filled out the EDA will meet to discuss the concerns. Our Office of Teacher Education and Clinical Practice will receive that uh, EDA and it will be filed away. Now, 
a person who gets two EDAs must meet with the EDA committee. That committee consists of the director of teacher education, program coordinators, faculty, and other administrators if needed. This committee will be convened by Dr. Robinson as the director of teacher education. Uh, the committee will meet, discuss the concerns, and uh, provide a consensus for what will happen, what will be best for that student. The reason why you do not want two EDAs to be completed on you is because you don't know the decision that that committee will make. So that decision might be, for instance, to move you to another school and for you to work on those different things that you need to work on based on the concerns. Or depending on the situation, it might be for you to not be able to move forward in the program. So you want to make sure that if you get a disposition um, on you, that you take that seriously and you incorporate what your uh, clinical supervisor, your mentor, teacher, your instructor, or others are saying to you so that you can uh, be able to move forward in the program and to be able to represent those professional dispositions. Now, once you all, if a person has the two and once the committee meets, then the teacher candidate will be uh, sent a formal decision letter and all notes will be shared after the meeting is committed, completed with the committee members and that teacher candidate. These notes will also be shared with the office of the dean and the dean's office will be able to review that decision letter and the notes taken at the EDA committee meeting and the candidate will have two weeks if they choose to appeal to appeal the decision. Also, a meeting will be scheduled with the candidate if it is requested by the candidate. So that is the concerns process. Before I move forward, I would like to ask, do you all have any questions? All right. So now let's talk a little bit about the student concerns process. If you have a concern that's related to advising, placements, licensure, certification, or teacher education courses, then you can complete this concerns process. So I'm gonna to go to the link. As you can see, this is a short form. So you're gonna put your contact information in the semester that the concern was submitted. Then you're going to choose your type of concern and then share a detailed summary of the concern and upload, upload any documentation related to that concern. So that's a brief form. This form will be submitted and reviewed by Dr. Robinson and she will be able to process that concern uh, and send it to the appropriate parties. about who you contact for things so that there are not delays since you have so many levels of support you want to make sure who the appropriate person is to contact so you're going to make sure that your mentor teachers and supervisors are your first points of contact for absences for lesson plans and for evaluations you will contact our office if you need practice you have licensing questions or background checks and placement questions. And then in terms of uh, seminar instructors, you'll reach out to them concerning the ed TPA. Now, I am proud of this cohort because many of you have taken your practices over this summer, your practice uh, continuity exam. So if you have not, by July 15, 2022, we have been tracking it. We've tracked every student who is a residency candidate and you will be receiving an email from me uh, asking you to submit a study plan if you have not taken your content, the content area exam that needs to be passed by December 1st. The reason why uh, you're gonna create a study plan is we want to make sure that you have planned out 
uh, enough time for you to take the test and to have time for a retake. If you take the test and you are unsuccessful on the examination, then you have to wait 30 days before Praxis will allow you to take the test again. So you don't want to wait. You want to give yourself more than enough time before December 1st. So there are several resources, and I'm going to show you all uh, some of these resources. We also went over this during the preview. But I want to remind you all of the resources that we have on the Praxis page. So here we have some study resources by program. So we do have the 5025 Early Childhood Education uh, session. So I do encourage you all, if you haven't checked that out, to go ahead and do that. We also have some other options. So we do have Praxis boot camps that we will be having primarily in September. Um, we will also have, if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me about goal development, about resources, and or if you just want to talk about your results and how you can improve, those are things that you can do one-on-one -on -one with me. You can email me to request my Calendly link. We also have library resources. We have a fantastic LibGuide you can access here and it has some study tips and it has access to books and other resources so that I have a link to the books and ebooks right there and then if you've taken the test and you've been unsuccessful and you want some additional study practice then I do encourage you to use 240 tutoring you can request a 240 tutoring account right there and that's a very short uh, link as well a very short Qualtrics. So if you've already taken it, if you uh, have a new test date to take your next test, this is for you. And then we have our practice exam requirements right here. Now here are some next steps you all, you all are gonna get quite a bit of time back. Um, so you need to apply for graduation by November 1st, if you have not already, that is the, um, COE internal deadlines for your application to graduate by spring 2022. All right, and I am going to, all right, so we now have a special presentation, some time for a special presentation by Dr. Raquel Harris. You all, you are just a year away from your own classrooms. You are going to be uh, ready to teach by the end of this year. And you wanna make sure that you have everything together so that you can be hired. And Dr. Raquel Harris from Career Services can help you do that. So she's going to share some services and she's gonna share her contact information. So this is where you wanna definitely write down in your notes about some of those options with Career Services. Dr. Harris. I'm going to uh, stop share. Welcome, so Dr. Harris. Share. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone? All right. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Robinson. Good morning, Ms. Perkins. It's awesome to see you guys. I'm once again um, trying to navigate Zoom. <laughs> okay. 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 All right. Again, good morning, everyone. It is uh, a pleasure to be here with you all this morning. Thank you so much for inviting me, Dr. Robinson and Ms. Perkins. I truly appreciate the opportunity to be able to present our services um, to, to, to students. So again, I am from the Department of Career Services here at the University of Memphis. And my name is Dr. Raquel Harris, and I am the career specialist for the College of Education. So I am your career specialist specifically. And so our mission um, with career services is to educate and empower you all so that you're able to invest in your own professional development to be able to compete successfully in a global society. And we do that by way of providing advising and coaching sessions to assist students with resume and cover letter development, as well as interviewing strategies and 
professional development opportunities that we provide for students by way of workshops, networking opportunities with employers, um, and also information tables. We also assist with job search strategies as well. And I want to emphasize the resume and cover letter development because the time is now, you guys, in order to start getting your documents, your professional documents together. You wanna to capture these experiences that you are about to embark upon on your documents. You don't wanna wait until May um, when you're in the thick of things and career opportunities start to present themselves. We wanna get ready now in order to be ready for those opportunities when they present themselves. We also do graduate school planning for anyone who is considering um, continuing their education. We can support you through that process as well. So in talking about our services, I do have a testimonial that I wanna share with you guys. And this is of a student who engaged in our services. And you will, as you listen to her talk about her experience with career services, you'll notice that many of the services that I just went, went over with you, she actually took advantage of all of those in order to secure her, uh, her dream job. So I'm gonna share that with you guys now. And um, we'll talk about ways that we can connect with one another and the platforms that we use. Trying to figure out what could I do with my psychology degree. So I ended up going to career services, trying to figure out what are some relevant things that I can do? I utilize the Tiger Link database where I found out about a position as a specialist for the Memphis Ambassador Program. So I was working with high school students, just pretty much trying to help them uh, become better citizens and better students. So I found out about that position through career services, and that kind of just solidified why I wanted to go into school counseling in the first place. And this is a part of my, also, when I was applying to graduate school, career services was the first place that I went. I had my resume edited, I had my personal statement looked at, and I even had a mock interview. And I made a specific, I said, please make this interview specific to get into a graduate program. Way of thinking. Okay. So currently at Memphis Catholic, I am a graduate level intern. Um, I work under the school counselor, so I consider myself a school counselor in training. Mm -hmm. um, so I work with the middle school students here to kind of help them exceed academically, figure out, you know, if they're going through any social issues or personal issues, we work through that. Because those things, they do affect how well you do at school. And not only did career services help me get into graduate school, I also got my first job, like career, my first teacher job. Mm -hmm. Um, so I will be starting as a school counselor at a middle school because I went to the education fair that we had this semester. You need to get involved with career services freshman year. Like we have information tables. As soon as you see career services go up and say, hey, I'm a freshman. I'm thinking about majoring in this. What internship opportunities are available? What type of things can I get involved in on campus to kind of make myself more marketable when it is time for me to start looking for jobs like don't wait until it's too late i say get started as soon as possible because you have the opportunity to explore and get exposure to stuff that you probably didn't even think i can do this with my degree so career services definitely help you with that okay so that was just one testimony of how you can utilize career services in order to help you progress or further um, with pursuing your dream job um, or even whatever, if you want to go and pursue additional educational opportunities, we can support you in that way as well. The biggest takeaway is don't wait. The time is now for you to take advantage of these, of these services that we offer. Um, if you wanna go ahead and connect with us, you can scan the QR code that's in front of you and it's gonna connect you with TigerLink. TigerLink Powered by Handshake is our platform that we use. 
And we use that platform to connect you with employers and their opportunities. So you're able to create a profile and uh, peruse jobs, um, employers post daily. Um, it's also the platform that connects you to career services. So if you want to upload your resume or a cover letter or a, a personal statement or a professional document, if you want to upload those to Handshake, you can and you'll get those reviewed by me and you don't need an appointment for that. But this is also the place where you can schedule appointments with me as well. If you want to go ahead and start preparing for those um, inter interviews, we can schedule a mock interview so that you can start preparing to respond to very common questions um, that are asked by hiring teams in the education field. Um, this semester, you guys, what we are really looking to do is to prepare you all for what's to come. And so the way that we are planning to do that is to integrate um, employers in our workshops and our events as, as much as possible so that you're able to ask the ex experts the questions that you have about those opportunities that are going to be before you. So if you want, um, me to send you that information and how to connect to those workshops that we are planning, you can scan this QR code and that's gonna take you to um, a form where you just give me your information and I can connect with you directly that way. We wanna encourage you guys to contact us and follow us on social media. We post a lot of opportunities on our social media for you guys. Um, so because they come to us constantly. So we post those and I also email those out every Friday um, through Navigate as well. Um, my main office is in Wilder Tower, but I will host drop-in hours uh, in Ball Hall um, this, this upcoming semester with you guys. And I'll be doing tabling as well because I want to be visible to you so that you know that you aren't in this alone and that um, Career Services is here to support you. So the time is now to connect with Career Services. Thank you all so much for the opportunity. And uh, I wanna congratulate you all on getting ready to embark upon your residency. This is a moment that you should be proud of. So congratulations to you. Thank you again, Dr. Robinson. And thank you, Ms. Perkins. I really appreciate it today. Thank you for coming and speaking to them. We appreciate it, Dr. Harris. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You all have made it to the end. We have two more slides. So after the question slide, um, Dr. Robinson is going to close and I have one more ask for you all. Um, so do you all have any questions? I have a question. Yes. During the first seven weeks, I know you said during the last eight weeks, we'll have to teach our lesson plans, but do we do that in the first seven weeks too? You will have a co-evaluation during those first mm -hmm. seven weeks, which will be like a practice run for you, Dominique, before you actually have your graded evaluation by the mentor teacher and then the supervisor. So that first one, the mentor teacher and supervisor will observe your first lesson together. They'll give you feedback that'll help you prepare for those two additional um, observations that they'll complete separately to make sure that you're ready once we start using that graded form. So you'll have time to get some practice during the uh, first seven weeks before you actually get graded and that grade goes into SLL. Does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am, thank you. You're welcome. Kamaya? Um, you guys had that slide about the assignments that are due for the first um, uh, semester. Um, in addition to those assignments, um, are there assignments that will be due in our classes as well? Yes, and your, yes. Ed, your seminar instructor will talk to you when you go to those classes and whatever other classes you're taking to this semester, when you attend those classes online or face-to-face, -face, those instructors will go over their syllabi and their requirements with you. 
Okay. Okay. Madison? Um, I saw on the slide about in service, it said to attend one day with your mentor during in service to offer assistance. My mentor teacher, she told me that some of their days are like actual professional development and some of them are like classroom days where they decorate. What day would I need to go? If you could, it would be great if you could go one of each day, Madison. Okay. So it would be great if you could attend a professional development and just kind of see how they prepare the mentor teachers for the school year. But it would also be great for you to go on a day that she's just working in the room because I can tell you my mom was a pre-K, kindergarten, first and second grade teacher. And all four of us plus my dad had to go help her get her room together. So if you went on one of those days when she's trying to get her room together to welcome the kids, she would probably appreciate that extra set of hands. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. I'd also like to add that um, I had a similar experience getting my classroom together. It was a family affair, but you also get the opportunity to communicate with the um, other teachers in the building who are also getting their classrooms ready. So it's just a great opportunity where you all can communicate uh, before the children are present. So that's just a great um, collaborative experience. Yeah. Brenda. Um, when Ms. Perkins sends you all the follow-up email with the recording and the different documents that she presented, she's actually going to put a breakdown in that email of how the first two weeks can count for you for those half Fridays. So I can give you an example. Let's say you go five days of the first two weeks. That would be the equivalent of 10 half-day Fridays that you would not have to attend on, on that half day Friday. So you could just count up the 10 Fridays that you would be required to go out. And those Fridays, you would not have to go if you complete five days. Now, the important thing to make sure that you all do so that you can get credit for those days that you go out early, you need to log the, all the days that you attend during the first two weeks. So you may start out doing it because Ms. Perkins is going to share the paper um, log with you. So you can start out using the paper log to log those days that you go during the first two weeks. But once the time log is ready in SLL, you need to make sure that you document those um, first two weeks days in the time log on SLL also, so that your supervisor will know the days that you attended early and that you are exempt from going on the Friday half day. Does that answer your question, Brenda? Oh, I see you said, okay, all right. William, we're gonna be sharing the music ed information during the music se session. So uh, if you are not able to attend that session, then you can, and you had just attended this one, uh, for these purposes of just getting general information, you can email me and I'll send you the information for how you all attend your first seven weeks. All right. And you should be able to refer Yours back to Thursday, the uh, residency. Mm -hmm. Yours is Thursday, 9 to 12. And if you've been here this entire session, then you will be hearing the same information over again with the uh, exception of what we talk about with the infographic. He just logged in. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, I had, um, I was confused because I came all day Tuesday and I wasn't sure about today. Uh, so I logged in around 10.30, I think. Um, so the music ed students don't need to come to these sessions only Thursday and maybe Friday? Yes, yeah, so you must come Friday and you only need to come to the music session for Thursday. Okay, okay. I've been taking notes and everything the past two days. All right, well, thank you for um, telling me that. Oh, you're very welcome. All right. Are there any other questions? All right, you all, 
I'm going to pass it to Dr. Robinson, and then I have one more ask for you all. So if you can stay on just a few more minutes, then that would be uh, great. I just want to thank you all for taking time to join us this morning, for being so attentive and participating and sharing such good feedback with us. You all were a wonderful group. Um, and I look forward to meeting you all in person on Friday and greeting you and spending a little time with you. So I will let Ms. Perkins close it out with her ask. And always, if you all think of anything following this orientation, please feel free to reach out to um, me and Ms. Perkins. We will be glad to try to answer your questions and assist you. All right, I have dropped a link in the chat for an optional Praxis Preparation Research Survey. You should have also received an email with this information. Uh, this is optional, a voluntary study that I'm doing as a part of my doctoral studies. And I, what the purpose of this research study is, is to examine the undergraduate and graduate, graduate teacher candidate levels of self-regulation and to predict whether teacher candidates pass or fail the Praxis one core and the Praxis two core examinations, controlling for content area, age, race, gender, first generation, traditional, non-traditional, and part-time, full-time status. This uh, survey is expected to take about 10 to 15 minutes. So if you're able to stay on and go ahead, and you actually don't have to stay on, but you can click the link and go ahead and uh, complete that survey, that would be very helpful. Um, you're going to be asked some demographic questions, and then you'll be asked questions that are adapted from motivated strategies for learning questionnaire, and you will be asked to give permission to access your practice examination scores. Some foreseeable risks or discomfort with your uh, participation include disclosing personal information about your demographics and your test taking experience, as well as your performance on the practice examination. But the benefits of uh, participating include uh, you being able to contribute to uh, practice, focus practice preparation support. And an indirect benefit will be the expansion of practice support for future cohorts. Also, if you participate in this survey, you'll be automatically entered to win one of five Amazon gift cards and they're uh, worth $5. After the survey is closed, uh, respondents will be randomly selected using the email provided on the survey. So uh, if you have the time, please go ahead and complete that uh, for us. Otherwise, you all are free to leave. Thank you all so much for participating. Bye-bye, y'all. Have a great afternoon. See you on Friday. Thank you. Thank you.